I'm Danielle McCartney, and today we're going to talk about conflict theory and white collar crime. So conflict theory focuses on the ways the unequal distribution of power influences the criminal justice system and shapes our understanding of wrongdoing. Richard Quinney argued that rather than a reflection of consensus, a society's definition of crime was the outcome of contention, of competition and conflict between more powerful groups and less powerful groups. But who are those powerful groups? William Domhoff names four ways to test who has the power to shape social structures like the criminal justice system. He says to ask ourselves, one, who benefits? So who gains if an act is criminalized and who loses? And then two, who wins? Whose ideas are accepted? Whose interests prevail? Three, who sits? Who occupies the seats of power? So for example, in Congress, the Supreme Court, or the presidency. And then four, who shines? Who has the reputation of being powerful? Okay, now back to Quinney. Quinney named six propositions describing how power struggles lead to this definition of crime. In Proposition 1, he says, crime is a legal definition. It's made by those with power, and it describes certain varieties of human behavior. So not every act is criminalized. So which acts are criminalized and which ones aren't? In Proposition 2, he says, the acts defined as crime by the powerful are the acts that threaten the interests of the powerful. In Proposition 3, he says the definitions of crime are applied by those with the power to apply them. So those classes of people who are in charge of law and law enforcement. Proposition 4 says people whose manner of acting has been defined by the powerful as criminal will tend to continue acting in that manner. So they will be defined as criminals by others, and eventually they'll define themselves in that way too. In Proposition 5, Quinney says the ideas that we have about the acts defined as criminal are shaped by those who have the power to widely spread those ideas, such as political leaders and owners of mass media. All of this leads up to Quinney's Proposition 6. Therefore, the social reality of crime results from those who win in the struggle to define criminal acts in relation to their interests, apply and enforce those definitions in law, shape behavior patterns related to those definitions, and promote ways of thinking that reinforce those definitions. So now that we've had an overview of conflict theory, how does conflict theory view white collar crime? Well, consider that many types of white collar offending are not typically defined as criminally illegal. So doctors, for example, don't go to jail for making medical errors. Corporate executives aren't sent to prison for creating unsafe products. And environmental pollution is defined as a cost of doing business. And those exposed to the pollutants are defined as unfortunate, but they are not defined as crime victims. Conflict theorists point out that we overemphasize street crimes like the war on drugs and perceive white collar offenders as less serious. White collar offenders often have the means to prevent their case from even being brought into the criminal justice system. Sometimes white collar offenders have shorter sentences because people argue that prison is harder for them and that the loss of reputation is more serious. Instead, conflict theorists would focus on things like state crime, which are crimes committed by or sanctioned by a state that violate international public law or a state's own domestic law. These include things like genocide, human rights violations, war crimes, illegal war, crimes against humanity. So conflict theorists would point out, for example, that using tear gas against protesters is a violation of the Geneva Convention. Instead of occupational crime, which are crimes committed during the course of a legitimate occupation for one's own benefit, conflict theorists would focus on corporate crime, which is crime committed for the benefit of the corporation. And this would include things like deceptive advertising, patent violations, manufacturing faulty or dangerous products. Conflict theorists would also look at environmental crimes, acts committed with intent to harm or with a potential to cause harm to ecological and or biological systems for either personal or business gain. 
In addition to corporate crimes like contaminating water by dumping chemicals into a stream or river, releasing pollutants into the air, and improper disposal, storage, or transportation of hazardous waste, environmental crime includes individuals dumping leftover paint thinner down a street drain, smuggling protected species across the borders, or individuals who illegally store hazardous waste. So that's it. Conflict theory emphasizes unequal power distributions. They point out that our ideas of crime are constructed by powerful people. And they point out we really should be looking at crimes by those powerful people. Thanks for joining me. I'll catch you next time.